Good morning. Whether you're here in the building with us or joining us online, we want to welcome you to today's service at First Mennonite Church. We hope this time together is a time of renewal, time of growth, uh, and a time of rest and peace. Uh, a few, in a few minutes, I'm going to be reading to you some scripture uh, from Genesis, the, the traditional Adam and Eve story. And uh, as most people under 50, I Google things a lot. And uh, so I was Googling Adam and Eve to get some more information. And the third hit down was, why did Adam and Eve buy insurance? And I thought, well, that's kind of a weird, weird link. Like, I better click on this to make sure. And I found out, well, they just needed a little more coverage. <laughs> so as we prepare our minds and our hearts for worship, I invite you to listen to the music provided and prepare for God.
Please bow your heads and join me in a call to worship. Lord, thank you for bringing us to your house today. Bless those bringing us your word this morning and prepare our hearts for worship. Speak to us and meet us where we are so that we may know you and love you. Amen. I believe at this time we have Andrea Regeer with some children's words. done this in person for a very long time <laughs> and I'm very nervous <laughs> but you're my friends and I will do it <laughs> um, good morning um, today is um, the last Sunday of February and February is Black History Month and um, so today I am actually going to not focus on on one single person but I want to talk about Black History Month in general um, I don't know if you knew this about me but I love history I'm very interested in my own family history, especially um, my grandparents' uh, generation, uh, where some uh, bad things happened. And I, I am interested in, in, in digging through that time. Um, I, um, I am also the newest member of the FMC Historical Committee. It's very exciting. Um, there's a whole room I didn't even know about in, in First Mennonite Church <laughs> that is very full of, of all kinds of cool old newspaper articles and different, different all kinds of different things that I'm excited to, to dig through and uh, learn about. Um, I also am very interested in black history in our country. Um, history is so very important. Um, it's something that I love to learn about, but it's also a very difficult thing to learn about. <laughs> and the more you learn, the more you know, the more kind of uh, uh, disturbing it can be. Um, but you know what, I'm gonna use this book that I once read a couple years ago to help explain why, even though it's hard, it is really important to learn more about history. This is a book that I talked about a few years ago during children's feature called Is There Really a Human Race? And um, I'm just going gonna, gonna to read the first few pages just to jog your memories. Is there really a human race? And then I'm going to skip to some parts in the book here. Um, is the race like a loop? Good job. Or an obstacle course? Am I, the, am I a jockey or am I the horse? Next page. Is there pushing and shoving to get to the lead? If the race is unfair, will I succeed? So hopefully, or maybe not, but hopefully this is coming back to you. Um, this book is, I think, available in our library here. I highly recommend it. It's very good. Um, and then this one page really caught my eye this time, thinking about history. Um, if the race is a relay, is dad on my team? And then the next page says, and his dad and his dad, you know what I mean. This is the part that was really interesting to me because... 
<clears throat> I think that history is a lot like a relay race. And for the kids who are listening, I'm going to explain what a relay race is if you don't know. A relay race is a race that is run with multiple people who take turns. So like, usually there's like four people, or sometimes more, and then the first person starts with a running stick, a baton, a, a, like, kind of like a stick. They run the first part of the race, and then they get to the next person, and they pass the baton to that person, and that person does their little part of the race, and then they pass the baton, that person does their part of the race, and then they pass that baton to the next person, and that person crosses the finish line. And um, so then it's kind of like a teamwork, a team, team effort to win the race. In many ways, I think that history is exactly or very similar <laughs> to a relay race, because what happens in the earlier does affect the people later on in the race. So for example, um, um, okay, Laura, you're my friend. I'm going to ask you a question. If you were um, in a race, in a, in a relay race, and you were the last person in the relay race, and the first two people in the relay race of your team um, got tackled and pushed down, and then a group of people just like sat on them for like 10 minutes. <laughs> Do you think it would affect your ability to run the race well? Yes. Okay, <laughs> I thought so, probably. Um, do you think that it would affect how excited you were about being part of this game, this race? Yes, definitely. It would definitely like, affect your morale, right? You would not want to run this. It wouldn't be very much fun anymore, and it would be, you would not be excited about that. Right, um, okay, so, <laughs> Um, let's, let's, let's make it more realistic to um, black history. Um, so if there was a relay race with like 15 people in it, okay, this is not unusual, but let's say it was like a really big race with 15 different people, and um, eight of those people got, a, got, got um, tackled, pushed down, and sat on, <laughs> I don't know, I'm just making up stuff, um, like just like we're immobile for a long time during their session until like maybe somebody even had to like walk over and grab the baton from them after so long. Anyway, that would make a very big difference to the people later on in the race, right? Yes. Um, and <laughs> I was just thinking about how like slavery, there's lots of different kinds of racism, but let's just stick with slavery for now. Um, slavery was something that happened since Christopher Columbus's time um, for a very long time, almost 400 years. So that would be like, if we're comparing generations to parts of a relay race, right? That would be like at least eight, relay, eight runners in the team that were completely immobilized and were, were um, sabotaged by other people running the race. And that would definitely have an effect on, on the runners who are la later on in the team. Um, and we could, take that, we could take that comparison farther and farther. I'm not going to go there because it's a children's feature. <laughs> we could take it farther. Um, as, a, as a white person, I'm talking about myself, um, in the next lane, um, how do I, how, if, I was, if, if I'm running this race and I'm in the next lane and I see this happening, and I heard that this was happening in the past and is happening a little, and is happening now. Um, what, what could I do? What would I do if, if, it, if it was really a race and I'm running and I see this happening? Well, I'm imagining, if, if I had kids here, I'd ask them. <laughs> I would ask them. And I, I, okay, what would you do, Laura? You would help the person up. You would tell the people that were attacking them that that was not very nice, right? Yes. Um, what else might you do? I don't want to put people on the spot here, but but I'll just I'll, I, I was imagining what what I know I, I was I'm imagining what people might say. Um, give them a piggyback ride. Um, work as a team to help to help people um, get out of that situation. Um, um, Make sure that those people that were attacking get consequences. 
um, like at least, right? I mean, that's, yes. <laughs> um, sometimes we want to just clear the lane and say, okay, now run, now go. Now, now you, you have a clear lane, you can go. <laughs> But if you know that eight of your players on your team all got, got, a, got uh, tackled and, and uh, attacked, it's not that easy. You don't really want to just keep running. You want justice for the things that happened back there. So anyways, I think Black History Month is a great time to look at that and remind ourselves about this big race that we're running um, and look at the un injustice that happened, that is happening, and, um, and then to to look at the people who even in spite of all that injustice and all that unfairness persevered, like the black uh, people who are black who, who persevered even in the face of all that unfairness, who persevered and, and, and made changes and made things better. We wanna remember those people for sure. We wanna remember the people who got pummeled and tackled. And then we wanna work on making sure that never ever happens again. Um, and then God says, surprise, it's not really a race. <laughs> We're all in this together, and we're all actually supposed to be in one lane um, on a journey all together, and it's not really a race. Um, when, one, when some of your teammates are, are attacked or tackled, you are supposed to work together um, right there and then, or you all, you all lose. Um, I was remembering that song, Marching in the Light of God. We are supposed to be marching in the light of God together. Um, okay, I'm going to read the end of this book because it does have a beautiful ending. And then I'll go back to my seat. Okay, I'm actually going to, yes, you're on the right page, but I'm going to read the sentence before this. Shouldn't it be looking back at the end that you judge your own race by the help that you lend? So take what's inside you and make big, bold choices. And for those who can't speak for, themself, for themselves, use bold voices and make friends and love well and bring art to this place and make the world better for the whole human race. Please join us as we sing 10,000 Reasons.
offering this morning is for local missions and uh, ensures that our buildings, our facilities, our communities will be continually blessed as we head into spring and, and the summer months. Please bow your heads and pray with me. Lord, your abundance is everywhere if we look for it. As we give back to you, we pray that this offering glorifies you. We pray that our offering provide blessings, provides hope, and provides courage for your church, your community, and importantly, your people. In your name we pray, amen. Our scripture this morning comes from the book of Genesis, chapter 3. <clears throat> now the serpent was more crafty than any other wild animal that the Lord God had made. He said to the woman, Did God say, You shall not eat from any tree in the garden? The woman said to the serpent, We may eat of the fruit of the trees in the garden. But God said, You shall not eat of the fruit of the tree that is in the middle of the garden, nor shall you touch it, or you shall die. But the serpent said to the woman, You will not die, for God knows that when you eat of it, your eyes will be opened, and you will be like God, knowing good and evil. So when the woman saw that the tree was good for food, and that it was a delight to the eyes, and that the tree was to be desired to make one wise, she took of its fruit and ate. And she also gave some to her husband, who was with her, and he ate. Then the eyes of both were opened, and they knew that they were naked, and they sewed fig leaves together and made loincloths for themselves. They heard the sound of the Lord God walking in the garden at the time of the evening breeze. And the man and his wife hid themselves from the presence of the Lord God among the trees of the garden. But the Lord God called to the man and said to him, Where are you? He said, I heard the sound of you in the garden, and I was afraid, because I was naked, and I hid myself. 
The Lord said, Who told you that you were naked? Have you eaten from the tree of which I commanded you not to eat? The man said, The woman who you gave to be with me, she gave me fruit from the tree, and I ate. Then the Lord God said to the woman, What is this that you have done? The woman said, The serpent tricked me, and I ate. The Lord God said to the serpent, Because you have done this, cursed are you among all animals and among all wild creatures. Upon your belly you shall go, and dust you shall eat all the days of your life. I will put enmity between you and the woman, and between your offspring and hers. He will strike your head, and you will strike his heel. To the woman, he said, I will greatly increase your pangs and childbearing. In pain you shall bring forth children, yet your desire shall be for your husband, and he shall rule over you. And to the man, he said, because you have listened to the voice of your wife and have eaten of the tree about which I commanded you, you shall not eat of it. Cursed is the ground because of you. In toil you shall eat of it all the days of your life. Thorns and thistles it shall bring forth for you, and you shall eat the plants of the field. By the sweat of your face you shall eat bread until you return to the ground, for out of it you were taken. You are dust, and to dust you shall return. The man named his wife Eve, because she was the mother of all the living. And the Lord God made garments of skins for the man and for his wife, and clothed them. Then the Lord God said, See, the man has become like one of us, knowing good and evil, and now he might reach out his hand and take also from the tree of life and eat and live forever. Therefore, the Lord God sent forth from the garden of Eden to till the ground from which he was taken. He drove out the man, and at the east of the garden of Eden he placed the cherubim and a sword flaming and turning to guard the way to the tree of life. We look forward to the words of Pastor Laura. Engrossed in the movement of the service, I forgot to put on my microphone. <laughs> so I don't... Um, mention Ukraine directly in my sermon this morning, but I hope that as we reflect on our human limitations, uh, what exactly sin looks like, what it looks like to choose against God, um, and also perhaps some of our own feelings of helplessness, it will be meaningful. Um, it will help us as we process the whole situation in Ukraine and of course many other tragic situations around the world. I decided to do a pre-Lent sermon, because Lent has a way of sneaking up on us. It's probably not uncommon for many of us to show up to church one Sunday and realize, oh wait, it's Lent, and we'll tumble through an extra prayer of confession and a sermon on repentance, and then go on our way and forget about Lent until next Sunday. 
I'm speaking from personal experience here prior to when I was a pastor. This was not uncommon for me. So I had this thought, let's do a getting ready for Lent Sunday. A Sunday when we think ahead to what's coming on Ash Wednesday. Hopefully some of you will join us for that, 7 o'clock. It will be a short 20 to 30 minute service. Now, the good news is that Jesus' resurrection is going to come on Easter, whether we're really ready for it or not. But the discipline of Lent is valuable in and of itself, whether it makes us truly and fully ready for Easter or not. So, why Lent? Traditionally, Lent, or the 40 days leading up to Easter, is used as a time of fasting and repentance. The 40 days being a reference to Jesus's 40 days of fasting in the wilderness, and also the Israelites' 40 years of wandering in the wilderness. Today, many of us might observe Lent by choosing to go without something for 40 days. So, going without pop or chocolate or perhaps social media. The idea being that the absence of something from our lives creates space for us to focus more on God and what God is up to. The question I would like us to reflect on this morning is, to what end or purpose? What is the point of whatever restriction or addition we choose to practice during Lent? What do we hope to have happen within ourselves? To some extent, everyone's response to that question will be, different or particular to their own lives. But on another level, I hope that whatever we practice during Lent, we are all drawn back into touch with our own humanity, our own status as God's creatures, God's created beings. This is why I chose this text of Genesis 3 for uh, our scripture this morning, because it roots us in the story, the origin story of our humanity. With all of our glory and our fallibility and limitations. We, meaning humankind, make choices that are not God's choices. When Adam and Eve eat from the tree that God commanded them not to eat, they made a choice that God would not have made for them. Why did they make that choice? Well, at the heart of it is this desire to be like God, to be more than what they currently were to have more than what they currently had. Then, of course, when they acted upon that choice or that desire to be like God, to be more than what they were created to be, then they suddenly become ashamed of what they are. So they act for more, they desire more, and then suddenly what they are becomes a source of shame. That all happened without God's involvement. When God comes looking for them, Adam and Eve are afraid. They hide because they are naked. Suddenly, in their own eyes, again, not necessarily in God's, their bodies are no longer good. You'll notice that when Adam and Eve express their fear of nakedness, when God comes looking for them, God doesn't say, ugh, 
you're naked, go put on some clothes. Instead, God asks, who told you you were naked? As if God is disturbed that anyone would suggest that nakedness is a problem for God's wonderful creatures. But for Adam and Eve, who desired more than what God had given them, their bodies were now something of which they were ashamed. Genesis 3 is our human story of desiring more. More than we need. More than what God has given. Genesis Genesis 3 is the story of our desire to be gods instead of God's creatures. The consequences of those desires are not more, but less. Less than what we already had. The serpent, Eve, and Adam all became more limited after their grasp for more. The serpent eats dust. Eve is pained in childbearing. Adam has to sweat and labor for food. And of course, Adam and Eve's relationship, which had once been loving and mutual, was now one of dominance and power. When Adam and Eve reached for the status of gods, God made sure that they stayed even more firmly grounded to the earth and the dust from which they came. For you are dust, and to dust you shall return. It wasn't a let me grind you into the dust, it was a, hey, wait a minute. You are not meant to be gods. That's not how I created you to be. You're creatures. You have limits. You are made from dust. Observing Ash Wednesday works to bring us back towards our own dusty reality. When we apply ashes to our hands or foreheads, we accept God's reminder that we are dust, and to dust we shall return. We accept God's reminder that we are creatures, not gods. Creatures that are woven into and dependent upon God's creation. Now, if we think of Ash Wednesday as a simple reminder that we're all going to die someday, it's mostly just depressing and doesn't serve a whole lot of a higher purpose. After all, our news is already full of reminders of how fragile human life can be. But if Ash Wednesday and the season of Lent that follows is an opportunity for us to get reconnected with the humble, limited, interdependent creatures that God created us to be, then that's a discipline worth observing. That's a season worth marking. I keep thinking about an article I read about the high percentage of Olympic athletes who wrestle with mental health challenges after the Olympic Games are finished. They've spent so much of their lives focused on pushing the limits of their bodies, pushing themselves towards these superhuman feats of strength and skill. And then when the competition is over, they have to confront the fact that their Olympic skills cannot last forever. 
and their lives and their bodies must find a new peace in being more ordinary. So as we prepare to enter Lent, let's take the opportunity to reconnect with our ordinariness, our creatureliness. So as we think about what we might like to add or subtract from our lives during Lent, here are some ideas to consider. Let's consider working in the dirt. Reminding ourselves of our dependence on the earth and how God fashioned us from it. Let's remind ourselves of the limitations of our human experience by visiting or participating in a different cultural setting. Perhaps we might want to visit a worship service uh, with Casa Batania. There are 4 p.m. Sundays in this building. Or perhaps we'd want to read a book or watch a movie that explores a culture that is very different from our own. Or perhaps we'd want to go check out Circles of Hope and see what their meetings are like. Experiencing different communities and different cultures reminds us of how small our own lives and experiences can be and also challenges us to grow. Let's also consider some prayers and rituals that thank God for our bodies. We don't do that often enough because our bodies have been lovingly made. They are God-breathed. Dirt, yes, but God-breathed dirt. Take some time to give thanks for our bodies with all their wrinkles and scars, birthmarks and awkwardness even those things we probably don't like about our bodies. Give thanks for them, because God made them, and they are temples for God's Spirit to dwell within us. As we think about Lent, let's also consider releasing some of the ways in which we try to play God in our lives. And this takes focused internal work. But releasing demands for perfection from ourselves and from others can be a good place to start. It's very hard to be gentle and gracious with others when we can't be gentle and gracious with ourselves. Rele releasing our focus on things like jobs, money, winning, popularity, success, all these things that promise to make us more secure, more infallible, perhaps even immortal. Releasing those things is a good spiritual discipline. Now, Lent, this practice of releasing is a lifelong journey, so don't expect to accomplish it in 40 days of Lent. But it's good to focus on it. However we choose to observe Lent, let our goal be to practice thriving within the limitations of our minds and our bodies. To accept and appreciate our creatureliness in relationship with God's godliness. To be clear, accepting our status as God's creatures doesn't mean we think of ourselves as lowly worms who are unworthy of God. 
Rather, rather, it means we release our desire to be gods, to be in control and at the center of everything. And as I mentioned, this releasing process is a lifelong journey. But the more we release, the less shame we have for being what we are. God's creatures. And the more we are able to enjoy our lot as God's mortal yet beloved creatures. So this Lent, less shame, less control, more dust, and more grace. to share that Addie and Jeff Kaufman experienced a fire at their North Newton apartment this week. I understand nobody was physically hurt, but we think of them as they rebuild after the loss of their home and possessions. Please pray with me. All-knowing God, we come to you with thanksgiving. We are thankful that you embrace us even as we have given into temptation this week, temptations to judge others or ourselves harshly, temptations to overindulge, taking more than we need and likely much more than our fair share, temptation to complain about circumstances, overlooking the abundant blessings you've given us. We give thanks for the resilience bravery and determination of so many black Americans, some of whose stories we've heard this month. Their commitments to justice and peace have improved the world, furthering your will. We pray for those experiencing illness, cancer, chronic pain, and unexplained symptoms. We pray for those experiencing mental illness, addiction, and survivors of trauma. We pray for healing, we pray for hope, and we pray for your comfort. We thank you for the care of medical professionals, and we pray for their endurance in such challenging circumstances. We ask for your protection of our youngest children, too young for vaccines. We pray for those in your world who are facing unrest and war, for our sisters and brothers in Ukraine experiencing military violence. We pray for your protection of everyone in harm's way, for the lives forever changed by the committing of violence and those experiencing unspeakable loss. We pray for the children of Russia and Ukraine confused and afraid. We commit to you the discussions that are happening and pray for peaceful resolutions. We pray for the Western District Conference Church Planting Commission as they implement a new strategic plan to engage the entire conference in initiatives for church planting, revitalizing congregations, and fostering relationships with emerging Anabaptist groups. With Mennonite Mission Network, we pray for the individuals interested in participating in youth venture in the summer and pray that pandemic restrictions will not prevent meaningful opportunities to serve. We ask you to prepare our hearts and minds for Lent, for intentional self-reflection and personal growth within our human limitations. We ask all this in Jesus' name. Amen.
please stand and join us for Cornerstone. to the time in our service for announcements and sharing. If you have something for us today, please come forward. Um, I was not giving, given any pressing news bulletins, so I invite you to consult your information and your bulletins. Well, 
Well, speaking of the bulletin, I would like to point out a special box that's uh, designated in your bulletin this week with two important announcements. Uh, one is that we are, as a church board, seeking um, delegates for a special session of the Mennonite Church USA, a special assembly, May 27th through the 30th in Kansas City. And there's quite a bit of information in the bulletin about it, so I won't just read it to you, but if you would be interested, we can have three, three delegates, and we can also have a delegate designated in an age group of 18 to 22. So please contact me if you'd like to uh, ask questions or talk with me about that. And then underneath that special box is an announcement about this was an unexpected expense and the church board approved payment of registration and lodging hotel expense. So uh, we did not put that in the budget. So we are asking for if you have any interest in supporting that financially, please just designate that in your offering. Thank you. I'll just also remind everyone that next Sunday we start our intergenerational diversity God's design curriculum down in the fellowship hall. And we've been working on making it available also by Zoom if you choose to participate that way. We are really excited about this. And if you do choose for Lent to make experiencing or understanding cultures beyond your own uh, one of your priorities, this is a great place to start. So hope many of you join us. As we enter into the benediction this morning, just a reminder that if you wish to socially distance, uh, you are invited to exit the congregation first uh, as we wait for the conclusion of the music and, and our dismissal. Uh, another word of, <coughs> of love during the intervention, uh, or I'm sorry, during the benediction, Jill will be playing Jesus Loves Me, which is a time-honored children's song that all of us enjoy. And we invite you to think about children um, in the Ukraine and places of conflict, as well as places locally, as they um, oftentimes cannot advocate for themselves and are victims of circumstances out of control. We just ask that you keep them in your prayers. Uh, please bow your heads and join me. The world is full of serpents and shiny apples. The world is also full of God and the Holy Spirit. The book of Matthew tells us that if we ask, we will be given. If we seek, we will find. And if we knock, the door will be opened. I encourage you to do these things this week and look forward to God's love. Amen. <laughs>